Airing on Asheville FM 103.3 LPFM in Asheville, this is The Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcasts and podcast emanating out of occupied Chalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from projects and struggles all around the world, and you can find our archives, transcripts, ways to follow us and support us at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org. This week we're featuring four segments. First up, you'll hear a chat with organizers of the 2024 Heart of the Valley Anti-Capitalist Book Fair, which ran its first iteration in Corvallis, Oregon, from January 19th to 21st. Then you'll hear a brief rundown of the Tiumen case in which six anti-fascists and anarchists in Russia faced terrorism and conspiracy charges after months of captivity, interrogation, and torture by the Department for Combating Extremism. The music in this episode will be samples from the benefit compilation composed of music by the Tiamen defendants themselves, which can be found at Bandcamp and also linked in our show notes. Next up, we speak with Aster of the counter-surveillance project NoTrace.how about their website, which hosts known instances of state surveillance, research and examples of countering surveillance, and the importance of keeping ourselves free while taking direct action. Just as a brief aside, if you plan to visit the site NoTrace.how, we suggest at least running a VPN, a virtual private network, just so you know, riseup.net has a free one that you can download for multiple devices. And we also suggest using an anonymized browser. One method might be also to download the Tor browser, which you can find for your operating system and device at ssd.eff.org. That's security self-defense on the Electronic Frontier Foundation website. They'll give you more tips there, and you can use that to visit No Trace Project via their tour address, which is listed in our show notes. Finally, you'll hear Sean Swain's reading of names of people killed by the cops in the USA. So we're joined by some of the organizers from the 2024 Heart of the Valley Anti-Capitalist Book Fair. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Would you mind sharing your names, any names, doesn't have to be your name, just a name, uh, gender pronoun or other info um, that you'd like to help out the audience with? Howdy. Um, I'm A and I use she, her pronouns. I am B and I use she, they pronouns. Thank you so much for having us a long time, first time, etc. Oh, shucks. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, could you tell us a bit about Corvallis, um, things like its size, its layout, economy, location, just sort of set the stage for the listeners? Yeah, um, is it cool if I take this one? Go for it. Yeah, so I would say that Corvallis is not totally dissimilar from Asheville. Um, We are a pretty small uh, rural community uh, located in Oregon's Willamette Valley. We have a population of about 60,000 people. Corvallis is kind of located on a little bit off the I-5 corridor. So we're, if you think about like where Portland and Eugene are, we're more or less right between them. Uh, so we are sort of surrounded by simultaneously like some of the biggest, like most left-wing cities in America, as well as like a lot of very, very like rural right-wing kind of uh, timber and farm communities. Um, uh, Corvallis is like a, a college town. Um, we have Oregon State University here, and that kind of has uh, made made it that so that Corvallis is like, I guess, pretty liberal left wing, but not entirely. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's definitely like a smaller place, but it has like lots of elements of uh, left wing and alternative culture that have been present in maybe lesser capacities than like Portland and Eugene, but have been present for like a very long time. Do you have anything you want to add to that? Um, I guess specifics on how the the city's chopped up. It's kind of like trisected. Um, There's like a south town, a downtown, and like a north town with like a suburbs in between all that. Um, And you can kind of see like economic disparities between all of that. Like a lot of the richer people live in the north and then, you know, working class homies are in the south. So that's kind of like typical with a lot of cities. But um, I guess that's kind of important to mention. Cool. How much sway does the university play in the city? I'm sure it's like kind of oversized, right? Oh yeah, massively. Like the college kind of runs the town, you know, and does all kinds of uh, fucked up shit to its workers and the city at large. Um, the there's, uh, I believe, three unions at the university actively like fighting, and many of like the workers there live po- on poverty wages. So it's that's kind of a big struggle that uh, is coming up 
the pipeline for a lot of uh, a lot of those of us who are organizing out here. And is it um, university aside or or including, but is it a pretty diverse place? Is it pretty white? Like I know that a lot of cities in or a lot of towns and cities like in the Northwest, like either have like large native populations there or have a lot of folks from East Asia who have settled in the area or from Latin America. How would you? Yeah, it's pretty aggressively white. I'd say there's like a lot of the diversity comes from the school and like folks coming from where they're wherever they're from. But other than that, like you might find some pockets of like, uh, I don't know. I know some like Guatemalan families that stay here. I know some like families from China here, but nothing like it's it's majority white. Cool. Thank you. Context. So I'd love to hear a thumbnail sketch of what was offered at the book fair this January, like who attended and what sort of things happened. Um, yeah, so the book fair was sick. Um, we took a lot of inspiration from uh, ACAP book fair in Asheville. Um, like that was kind of our primary model. And we organized it not so much just like as one book fair event, but as like a sort of three day long festival across a bunch of different venues. So we had I think six different venues, over a dozen events. Um, we had three different th- three different parties. We had multiple shows. We had workshops. We had book talks. We had yeah, all kinds of different stuff. It was super super cool, um, and I think uh, was like a really really positive thing for our area. Um, yeah, that's that's really exciting, and I'm sure the Asheville organizers will be really stoked to hear that. Well, you've kind of talked about how it's. The city has and surrounding communities kind of do have some sort of like radical temperament to them and have for a while. There is an existent radical community in the area and being between those two other cities that that have longstanding like politically left uh, flavor, I guess, is like it's like a yeah, that that seems not disconnected. Yeah. But I wonder what goals did you have for the book fair in terms of relating to ongoing organizing or spaces or community uh, in the area and sort of like maybe even tying time, like cementing ties between those three, those three cities. I think that that was a a huge goal and just finding a, a physical space where a lot of people from a lot of different tendencies and backgrounds could be together and interact and, uh, uh, forge friendships and working relationships. I think that was huge. Um, one thing that's really awesome about Corvallis, I think, is because we are sort of a smaller population, we aren't really subject to a lot of the really like nasty sectarianism and drama that pervades uh, like the scenes in Portland and Eugene and other places in the state. So you know, it was kind of a nice like neutral ground where a lot. I think a lot of different people of different backgrounds and tendencies could get to interface with each other um, and like also get to know like our local organizing because I think a lot of what we do locally is very cut cut off from statewide networks because so many organizers from urban centers really only focus on urban centers and don't really ever look to rural places for inspiration or collaboration. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's kind of similar to what I mean, there's definitely definitely competitions for space or, you know, feels that come up in Asheville around alphabet soup leftist organizations like PSL taking a lot of space and doing it badly. But even like, yeah, just kind of off the cuff, like there's there's no like strong among like anti-authoritarians. There's no like strong organization that is like there's no there's no Black Rose chapter here. There's no actually I don't think there's an IWW chapter here at the moment. And I've seen over the like the last de- decade and a half or so of living here that as opposed to growing up in in the outer reaches of the Bay Area, you would see whatever like leftist organizations, peace and justice centers, um, Marxist political you know parties, whatever all sort of taking space and that takes a lot of your, your head and it kind of like divides lines in the community. So it's nice if in a smaller place where people have less capacity, they're kind of forced to get along with each other a little bit better and work through disagreements. Right. Yeah. I think that's pretty accurate. So I know y'all have a zine coming out about the first book fair, uh, which seems pretty informative from what I've seen of it, not to hash out all the details 
that folks can later read on their own. But what are some of the takeaway lessons that you had from this first one? Um, things that worked well or things that you'd do different? Do you, do you want to start? And yeah, I can, I can throw some stuff on. Really good communication with your venues, because if you want to have events again, you might want to maintain like very frequent uh, uh, relationships. And even if you're not doing book fairs every year, you're going to be doing different types of events. Um, and this can work in kind of both ways where it can open up really awesome relationships with places that you might have never been before. Um, but it can also be a, a point of criticism for how how you're communicating during the book fair for how it might go after. Yeah, um, I think another kind of takeaway that we received critique on um, because so uh, after our book fair, we put out this survey and we kind of asked our community, like, hey, we think we did this really cool thing, but tell us how we fucked up. How did we, you know, how could we do better next time? And another thing that people talked a lot about was uh, the different, like, sort of speakers and stuff that we had because we had a bunch of workshops that we just kind of, we put we put an application out into the, um, out into the universe. It was like, hey, radical people who want to put on a workshop, you can do it. And we accepted more or less every workshop application we had gotten. Um, and pretty much all of those workshops were like run by white people. And also it should be said that like some of them, uh, people who attended felt were like just kind of boring or not relevant or did not really represent like the politics that they were wanting to learn about especially like that's something we got criticism on from like new people to the left that were like okay i'm trying to get involved and i'm you know stuck in a very like weird intense theoretical discussion that i have no uh understanding of so i think we're really going to try to do more curation of like content in the future and less like kind of laissez-faire, whoever comes, whoever applies gets to, uh, gets to do something. So to touch on those two, like, uh, chronologically, I guess with the reaching out to the venues, is that so that, um, like, because venues will end up forgetting that they told you that you've got a, a date saved and then give it away or because of capacity questions or the nature of the event or what, what sort of like miscommunication, uh, was experienced there? I think it was a lot of the places that we frequent and have events at before the book fair, um, we already had a pretty great relationship with. So while it was happening, uh, it was at least for some places that we were at expected us to be doing a similar sized event. And there was a misunderstanding of scale, I think. So now when we bring, I don't know, a hundred plus people into these places where we're doing like maybe 20, 50, um, on a weekend or something, it's like, whoa, this is like a different ball game here. Um, so I guess being more clear about your your group scale, um, also getting contracts if y'all are like if you have a, a place you have in mind for making your book for happen, um, just so there's some guarantees and some some lines drawn, um, just making sure you don't cross any boundaries with with uh, where you're booking your places. Yeah, we we also just had like lots of little little tiny things that got messed up, like just like miscommunication about where to put XYZ thing away, where to, you know, ha, yeah, uh, <laughs> are, 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 are we, are we using your printer too much? Stuff like that. And it's just, you know, ultimately we, if we want to do something that is like a institution in our community, we have to like work to foster those relationships. I think sort of a lot of those little tiny details and courtesies that we would be engaging with otherwise or engaged in otherwise, um, get kind of lost when you're hosting this giant thing and there's like, you know, a couple hundred people in a room that you have to like facilitate all the things for. And yeah, so I think that just kind of slips away. Yeah, no, that makes a, that makes a lot of sense. Did you have a sense of how many people were going to show up beforehand? It's not, it, I, I don't, I can't imagine how you would have really like, it's not like everyone's going to RSVP. Although you did have like a housing, a housing sign up, right? That is true. Yeah. We had, I think everybody had a different answer for how many people we thought were going to show up. Um, and A and I thought it was going to be higher or at least like a slightly higher than the turnout we ended up having. But most people said that it was going to be, uh, the scale was going to be lower than, ex than what the folks that ended up showing up. Yeah. I mean, we definitely knew that it was going to be really quite big um, yeah. just because of the like sheer amount of engagement we were getting on social media and just the amount of like, different people that we knew would be in attendance because they were going to be tabling or doing workshops or whatever else. 
But yeah, uh, it was definitely like it did take us, it did like kind of take us by surprise. We also, uh, in the forms that we received, like the response forms, kind of got a uh, criticism that some of the spaces were like really, really tightly packed. Like we did a film screening and it was standing room only and like people were having had to like sit on each other's laps and like we're literally like falling out of the room that we had it in. Um, and then like, you know, just like other stuff, like similarly with workshops and it's, it, we, 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 you know, we, we really need to be thoughtful of like, Hey, how many people will actually show up to this? And definitely are probably going to invest in like bigger venues and spaces next year when we do it. Yeah. And, and considering like when, when the, the like the time of the year when this occurred, when the weather wouldn't be that happy outside for people to be like opening the doors and just kind of standing outside. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense with the presenter uh, curation stuff. Did you or do you have any plans, assuming that you're going to have a next one for taking a survey from people of what kind of things they'd like to see, either like just like out into the universe or or among the tablers, like people that are going to be invested in being there. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think that would be a great approach for, um, before we put out our, um, who wants to do workshop call. Um, because I feel like we started with asking folks what they could do instead of what they wanted to do or like asking our like quote unquote audience per se, um, what they would want to see out of a workshop. And in that regard, we were able to, vet a lot of our workshops a little bit better because we were like, oh, we know that these people do this thing and they, they're down to do a workshop on like self-defense or we know like we understood that people have their specialties of, of folks we knew personally and we were able to, that, that was just an easier process. Um, but I think next year it would behoove us to uh, uh, put out a call of like, what are some things folks saw last year of the workshops that they want to see again? And then what are some new things that people might be interested, uh, interested in and maybe even adding like some examples to um, that? Yeah, I think that that would be a great idea. Yeah. So, I mean, do you do you have plans for a subsequent book fair? Um, is it too, too, too soon to talk? I mean, this is only this happened a uh, month and a half ago ish. Like, I think it's it's potentially a little too soon to talk, but I think we had some really awesome bones from this one that we're, we're going to apply to the next one. Um, and with just applying the, the bits and critiques and, and experiences that we had. Yeah, I think we're definitely going to do a next one. I think the current plan is to shoot for fall of 2025 um, because uh, just we got so, uh, the weather was so gnarly for our thing that we don't want to do it like, exactly a year later so our thought is kind of to do it during fall and maybe providing like a bunch of the new students who are coming back uh with like a, a, a awesome nexus point to like plug in with a bunch of local organizing and see like you know about what uh what like cool radical stuff is happening in corvallis i think i also want to add context that a week before kind of, actually like the week of the book fair we had an ice storm here and it completely froze over the city um which canceled a lot of folks' plans, but it was still an awesome turnout considering. Yeah, that's great. Um, I know with the Asheville Book Fair last year, the uh, it being that it happened in the high heat of August in the South <laughs> in a rainforest, it was <laughs> like not freezing temperatures and it was not um, like COVID peaks or anything like that, but it was hot as shit. And so the windows were open and then it was also like, it ended up raining super hard throughout and to the point that like people inside of venues sometimes could not really be heard by the audiences. If you listen to any of the recordings that, um, that got taken, uh, that, that, have, that are up on the website for the radio show, you can hear like, like when Muribo Kadali is speaking, um, it's just pounding rain. You can hear like, cars passing by and splashing like water because the windows are open because it's so hot it was ridiculous i guess you can't really control that sort of stuff but yeah that makes a lot of sense to to try to move it to a time of year when you're not going to have to deal with ice storms for sure do you have any social media or web presence where we can point listeners to check out like a a list of like what was what was going to be happening during the book fair um or uh your announcements and stuff or where the zine um, 
is going to come out and and sort of who the I'm also wondering well, yeah, I'll just ask that afterwards. But but yeah, is there any play are there places online where the existing like this year's event are documented? Yeah, so our website is hotvbookfair.noblogs.org and that's uh where you'll see like our full plenary of events. Um you'll we will also put the zine there when we are when we publish it. Um and then all of the social media went through a group in town that uh, we kind of do event planning stuff through called Fuchsia. So um, it's on Instagram at fuchsia.corv, C-O-R-V. Yeah, and with that, I mean, I keep harping on the zine, but I think it's uh, it was something that I was hoping that the Asheville folks would put together at some point is just sort of like a documentation of of process and um you know just in case so someone could pick it up and take it back to i don't know athens georgia or greensboro or whatever knoxville and just say like we want to have a radical or anarchist book fair maybe like w- don't want to be starting from scratch and then be able to look at the zine and and like say to yourself okay well let's Let's make a list of the resources that we've already got. What venues do we have connections with? What bands are around here? Like that sort of stuff. It seems like a really useful, I don't know if it's designed um, for perpetuity for just Corvallis or for if it's sort of like a a little starter for other communities or what, what folks are thinking about that. And yeah, that's definitely like kind of the goal that we had. Um, you know, I think that we feel like we were really successful in um, the organizing that we did. And I think that we, at least I I feel like we brought a lot of things to this space that I feel have been like, I don't want to say lacking, but like I think other book fairs could have really used to be cooler. Um, maybe not cooler, but like things that I would have liked to see in other book fairs that I've been to. Um, so like I would hope that uh, folks do sort of see that and maybe consider implementing stuff into the, their own projects. Because yeah, like uh, I want more radical spaces to be happening and uh, across the across the PNW and wherever, and if we can help that happen in ways that like are sick, that would be sick. Yeah, I'd also say like based on where the zine's at right now, it's pretty replicable in a lot of places, and we acknowledge that it's not going to look the same as the one we had here, and that's completely okay, and it should be kind of be like that. Um, yeah, yeah, more radical spaces. Let's see it happen. Yeah, the final thing that I will say to your listeners is like, you know, we didn't really have any experience at all doing any th- any event of this scale really ever. And like, you know, if you want to see this thing happen in your town, you can put together something really cool by getting together like a couple of your friends and like really put throwing some effort at something. It's like not that hard to do. And like, it's, you know, you can make you can make really sick stuff out of, you know, thin, thin air. So really recommend y'all try to do it if you can yeah and i'll say that like the the people that put on these events are often accessible the like victoria book fair was going on at least was going on for a few years i don't know if it still is but like starting in 2020 they were doing a huge amount of content online and a lot of that audio is now available in from embers podcast feed or like yeah, I don't know. Like, there's a, there's a lot of different ways to do it, and um, depending on the size of what you've got available and what you want to see, yeah, it could definitely look a lot of ways, which is great. Well, A and B, thank you so much for having this conversation and and for the event, and hopefully, I'll be able to make it out next time it happens. That'd be fun. Thank you so much for having us. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Better see you there. Bah! And if um if you are in Asheville in the oh shit when is it it's in it's in june anyway um but i'm forgetting the dates now i want to say june 19th uh if if you happen to be in the southeast and you want to come to another book fair feel free be welcome introduce yourselves (laughs) maybe i will yeah maybe do it This is the Final Straw Radio, and you just heard our chat with two organizers of the January 2024 Heart of the Valley Anti-Capitalist Book Fair in Corvallis, Oregon. If you want to support the Final Straw Radio, you can subscribe to our podcast via various platforms, follow, rate, and share our materials online, and learn more at tfsr.wtf. And if you'd like to fund our transcription work that allows for easier translation, more accessibility of content, and the zines that we produce 
from each interview. Consider picking up some merch from us or making a one-time or recurring donation via PayPal, Venmo, Stripe, or LibraPay. Or joining our Patreon to access early release content and other goodies via the links that you can find at tfsr.wtf slash support. Next up, you'll hear a brief summary of the Tiumen case of anarchists and anti-fascists framed and tortured in Russia. Shout out to the buddy who read the part of the Tiumen support crew. Would you please introduce yourselves with any names, gender pronouns, or affiliations as makes sense for this conversation? Unfortunately, as a rule, we do not name names. I think it would be more correct to say that this is an interview with a member of the Tiumen Cause Support Group. Will you introduce us to the so-called Tiumen case? What was alleged by the state to have happened? In short, in August 2022, two friends from Tiumen were detained by patrol officers on the outskirts of the forest, suspecting them of distributing drugs. But instead of drugs, they were found to have a homemade explosive of 300 grams in size. Both were immediately taken to the Department for Combating Extremism, and over the next two days, four more young guys were detained. Two from Yekaterinburg, and two from Sergut. The date of detention indicated in the resolution appears as a day later than the actual detention. During this period of time, all the guys were tortured into giving confessions. Based on the imaginary date of detention, the investigator conducted an interrogation, during which all the guys admitted that they were members of the terrorist community, not forgetting to also indicate the involvement of the others. That is, according to the state, immediately after the arrest, in fact the next day, our comrades laid out all the ins and outs by admitting to the crime and doing all the work for the special services, which sounds ridiculous in itself. During the year and a half that investigative actions have been ongoing, psychological pressure has not ceased to be exerted on our comrades. Confrontations are held in the same building where the torture took place, the building of the Department for Combating Extremism. Under pressure from the investigation, one of the defendants entered into a pretrial agreement and testified against the other guys. Now the defendants and their defenders have moved to the stage of familiarization with the materials of the criminal case. Who are the people who are accused? Can you name them, tell us a bit about each of them, and why it's believed that the state targeted them? All the detainees, being ideological anarchists and anti-fascists, opposed street neo-Nazism in their cities, and also did not hide their negative attitude towards military actions by Russia. According to the Criminal Code of the Russian Federation, each participant must have a specific role, but first things first. Daniil Chertikov is the frontman in an underground band called Rocker Balboa. In one of the songs he sings, Go through your conscience with a machine gun at the ready. It has long been known that war is not a place for miracles. Close your eyes to the truth. Get used to someone's screams. Hide behind a sense of duty and throw away humanity. In another song, he says, Russia, America, China, Ukraine are just pieces of a huge world, a world that does not want war, although different countries but the same people. Daniil is also a veterinarian, and therefore the investigation assigned him the role of a physician in an imaginary community. Nikita Olenik and Roman Paklin jointly opened a free anarchist library in the city of Surgut, and Olenik is also a fairly well-known figure in the anarchist milieu of Surgut. According to investigators, Nikita Olenik is a community organizer. Yora Neznamov was engaged in 3D modeling, and we assume that he was detained because of his acquaintance with Nikita Olenik. According to investigators, Yora was involved in financial issues in the community. Deniz Aden is also a musician. He played in the hardcore band Siberian Brigade and the black metal band Rasputin. Kirill Brick was also interested in music and created a solo extreme project called Moth in the style of digital grindcore and ambient noise. Denise and Kirill were detained with explosives. The investigation called them pyrotechnics. Where did the cases take place? Are these locations hotbeds of dissident activity? The case itself is being conducted in the city of Tiumen, as I said earlier. The rest of the defendants were detained in the cities of Surgut and Yekaterinburg. It is difficult to say regarding hotbeds of dissident activity, since events related to war, as a rule, do not occur only in one region. Russia is a large country, gripped by the struggles for survival. Outbreaks flare up and go out here and there. Are the defendants connected? All the accused are familiar because they are members of the same subcultural movement and have previously crossed paths at various festivals and concerts. Some of the defendants are better acquainted with each other than others. For example, Roman Paklin and Nikita Olenik have been close friends for many years. 
and Daniil Chertikov saw Denise Aden and Kirill Brick only once in his life, and this meeting was very short. I've already reported on the library and musical activities earlier. Can you talk about the torture experienced by the defendants and the lasting effects that they're suffering from it? Electric shock, strangulation, bullying, psychological violence, and threats of sexualized violence were used. Nick and Roma were tortured first in an airplane hangar outside the city. Then they were brought to the anti-extremism unit and tortured again. The rest were tortured only in the Department for Combating Anti-Extremism. Daniil, during the torture, heard Yoda's screams coming from the next office. When asked, what is this, he received the answer, be grateful that you are not lying in your blood, urine, and shit right now. Daniil was threatened with reprisals against his partner, Elena. After receiving electric shocks, Yoro was forced to shout that he loved Putin. Yoro also reported in a lawyer's interview that he was threatened that he would be taken to the border with Ukraine and shot. And Denise reported that he was threatened that his partner Diana would suffer because of his incorrect testimony. Roman Paklin had serious complications after torture. His eyesight was severely damaged and his hand almost gave out. In response to his requests for treatment, the management of the pretrial detention center only provided him with painkillers. Currently, Roma is undergoing treatment in the Lebedev Psychiatric Hospital in the Tumen region. Would you say that the Tumen case falls into a pattern with other cases such as the Network or Penza cases of six years ago? Of course. The style of conducting a case is absolutely identical in all such cases. The main evidence is always confessions that were given under torture, as well as the unreasonably long process of collecting case materials. Is it alleged that the arrests and charges relate to the war in Ukraine somehow? As far as we know, the investigation indirectly mentions in the charges that the guys were planning to blow up military registration and enlistment offices and railway lines supplying military equipment to the front. However, the indictment does not mention that this is the only and main goal of the guys, but only as an example of the planned activity. The main motivation of the detainees, according to investigators, is directly anarchist ideology. One thing is certain. The screws are being tightened, and the most free-thinking groups of the population, such as anarchists, always suffer from this. What do security services gain from these cases, and what do movements lose? Movements are losing cohesion and self-confidence, and the state is consolidating control over the regions. Intelligence agencies, in turn, receive promotions and improve detection statistics. How can people in the international audience provide solidarity for these folks? Is fundraising still ongoing? Can they receive letters? Or would international solidarity actions be appreciated? Or anything else? Fundraising is still relevant because there are substantial trials ahead, and an impressive amount will be needed to pay for the work of lawyers, about a million rubles. The guys are very happy to receive letters and try to answer them as best they can. We try to cover all events taking place in support of our comrades in our Telegram channel. This is very important because any publicity helps us tell as many people as possible about what is happening. About information about cases, if we mean the Tumen case, then we run a Telegram channel, as well as an Instagram. If the question concerns other political affairs in Russia, then in our Telegram channel we have prepared a folder with the most high-profile cases and people who found themselves in a situation similar to our comrades. Thank you very much for having this conversation. This is the Final Straw Radio, and you just heard our brief summary of the Tiumen case of anarchists and anti-fascists framed and tortured in Russia. More info can be found at avtonom.org.
Coming up, you'll hear our recent chat with a member of the security information sharing site for anarchists that's found at notrace.how about countering state surveillance. Big thanks to the Gollum comrade who read the part of Aster in this chat. Would you introduce yourself, a pseudonym and pronoun that we could maybe use, what part of the world you're based in, and, and maybe how you got interested in the technical side of activism? You can call me Aster. My preferred pronoun is the singular they. I'm from Europe, and I've been involved with the No Trace Project since its beginning about three years ago. If by technical side you mean collecting text and managing a website, I think I've always liked this kind of work. It's calm and ordered. I think in another life I could have been a librarian. If by technical side you mean working on the topics of surveillance and security, I think it first started some years ago when I felt frustrated about how comrades around me approached these topics. I felt that they were spending a lot of time thinking about how to fight cops in the streets, the ones you encounter during demonstrations and riots, and not enough time thinking about how to fight the cops in the offices. And the cops in the offices are the investigators, the intelligence analysts, the ones that are often responsible for sending our comrades to jail for long sentences and disrupting our networks. So if I felt like there was a need to spend more time countering this aspect of repression, the surveillance, the investigations. Also, I felt like many new traditional leftist organizations were working on the issue of mass surveillance, of the wrongful surveillance of law-abiding citizens. The revelations made by Snowden in 2013 of the mass surveillance practices of the NSA, of course, helped to put focus on that. But I felt like not enough people were working on the issue of targeted surveillance, on what the state does when they target specific people. A number of comrades around the world had, of course, developed thoughts on this, but I felt that these thoughts were scattered around the Internet and hard to find. So that's how the No Trace Project started, as a central place to gather zines and articles made by comrades on targeted surveillance to make them more accessible. Thanks so much for speaking with us. Would you talk about No Trace Project and how it developed? Did it develop out of any kind of surveillance coming to light that you'd want to mention? I don't think it developed out of any specific thing, but I was certainly influenced by surveillance happening around me. Some close friends were facing intense police surveillance and harassment, and we didn't, in my opinion, deal with it appropriately, which led to a lot of disruption in our network and people getting burned out. A distant friend was arrested after their DNA was found on an intact incendiary device. I was particularly frustrated about DNA in general because so many anarchists worldwide were getting arrested and are still getting arrested because of DNA traces. And a number of those arrests looked like they could be prevented if people were better informed. So anyway, the No Trace Project started in 2021 as a website that collected resources, zines, articles about surveillance. The website design was really bad at the time. It's a bit better now. We were collecting stuff, but not writing our own content. Later, we started to feel inspired to write our own content, and we decided to tackle the issue of threat modeling. Threat modeling is a formal exercise where you identify the threats you face in a specific context and what you can do about them. So for example, in the context of an action, you identify the techniques that the police could use against you and how you can protect from those techniques. The result of the exercise, the list of threats, is your threat model. In some anarchist circles, there's this recurring situation where someone asks what security measures they should take in such or such context. For example, if they can take their phone to a demo, or what email provider they should use, and people answer, it depends on your threat model. But how does one determine what is their threat model? What surveillance techniques are available to the police and in which contexts? And how can we protect against them? In 2023, we added a new section to our website, the Threat Library, to try to answer those questions. It's a work in progress. We're adding content regularly. Feel free to check it out. Later in 2023, we got in touch with another project called Ears and Eyes, a big database of hidden surveillance devices used against anarchists. Bugs, hidden cameras, GPS trackers on vehicles. We agreed that it would be good to move their project to our website, so we did that. And I think that's all for the current developments. What are some of the shorter and longer-term goals of the project? In terms of shorter goals, I would say to keep our website updated by adding new resources, new content to our threat library, new cases to ears and eyes. 
We have several original publications that should be released soon, including an original zine on physical surveillance and an English translation of a French zine on DNA. Our threat library currently lists about 20 repressive operations that have targeted anarchists around the world, and I'd like to add more, to reach maybe 40 or 50 operations. We're also working on various translations with the help of external translators. I'm hoping to have our threat library translated to French in the next few months, and probably to Brazilian Portuguese at some point. Maybe German, too. In terms of longer goals... I guess we aim to become a good resource about surveillance and security for anarchists worldwide. I'm not yet sure what this will entail. We're discovering that as we go on. A sort of vision I have is to encourage the creation of small, decentralized groups working on issues related to surveillance and security, and then sharing their work with the larger anarchist movement. A bit like affinity groups of action, but for technical research. Like, imagine a group in one country researching cheap ways to hack or take down police drones, or good protocols against DNA traces, or an analysis of thermal imaging used by police helicopters, and then sharing their research publicly so it can be used or expanded by other groups in other countries. Ideally, I'd like our project to encourage that. So we at The Final Straw tried our hand in this project years ago to to attempt to talk through some technological surveillance issues and in ways that people were talking about evading them based on the U.S. model of, you know, having access pretty easily to unregistered SIM cards and setting up pseudonymous phones and also attempting to, this was like attempting to increase people's comfort around recognizing the methods that we understood the state to employ in surveillance. Technical knowledge and skills are an area that many people don't think that they have a proclivity for, and so it becomes considered specialized. But I think of it more as a series of muscles that you strengthen through use as opposed to something innate and inborn. Is there an element of no traces that how um, focused on or hoping to reach a wider audience who may be on the cusp of increasing their skill sets? Or is it mostly just directed at those technical research affinity groups? Ah, yes, that's a good question. I think in terms of content, we want to focus on sort of higher end security practices that are relevant to people who risk being targeted by the state, people who risk years or decades in prison. But we do want to encourage everyone to follow these security practices, or at least some of them, and we do want to make them as accessible as possible. We want to encourage everyone to have good security because even if someone isn't doing anything too risky, maybe their friend does or their friend's friend. Individual security reinforces collective security. And just to be clear, this is not just about tech security. The majority of our content isn't about technology. And while some non-technology security practices require developing a specific skill set, for example, detecting if you're being followed by cops, some other just require good communication skills. For example, the need to know principle, which simply states that sensitive information should only be shared when it is necessary to do so and to the extent necessary. So then there's the question of how to make our project accessible to a variety of people how to make it a good place to learn. We try to write our original content in a clear way that doesn't assume too much prior knowledge from our readers. All of our original content is available as printable zines so it can be read and shared away from computers. And of course, we want to do translations, a lot of translations. One thing I haven't talked about yet that is somewhat related to this topic is another reason I got involved with the No Trace Project. I wanted to codify knowledge that is often transmitted only informally in anarchist circles. At least in the circles where I was active, many security practices were not codified, were not shared in meetings or written down in zines. For example, it took me years to understand the dangers of DNA because it wasn't a topic that was discussed openly. Security practices were transmitted informally, sure, but that's not welcoming of newer or more isolated comrades who may not be part of the informal discussions. I'd like our project to be welcoming of those comrades too. Yeah, that seems like an important point. The codification, as you put it, or or at least the bringing of those practices to more people's awareness. It also seems like there's an opportunity here for 
spreading the word of instances of movement surveillance and interference, anti-repression organizing, and the poss- and possibly mapping state and parastate strategies and methods so as to build more resilient resistance. Can you talk about this as well as the possible repression or shifts in adversarial methodology that you all might expect in response to the public exposure of these surveillance methods and tools? Like, could someone, for instance, could someone face charges for releasing information about the state spying? Indeed. I'd like our project to help spread the word about specific instances of repression. About instances of repression, many anarchist groups are focused on solidarity and prisoner support. And while I believe this focus is extremely important, I feel like sometimes the more factual, technical aspects of repression are neglected. So in relation to instances of repression, I'd like our project to focus on, like, what happened? What happened for these comrades to end up in jail or for this promising movement to disappear? If they're able to tell us, Can we learn from their experiences? And I guess that showing comrades that we take their experiences seriously and that we are dedicated to learn from them can also be a form of solidarity. About, will the state adapt because we reveal their strategies? I think at a local level, they can adapt. For example, if you notice cops following you in the streets, it's generally in your advantage to not show them that you notice them. Otherwise, they will adapt and be more discreet. But at a global level, I don't think the state adapts well. And when they adapt, I think it's more likely to be because of new technological developments, for example. At a global level, I think it's always in our advantage to reveal their strategies. To the question of someone could get charges for revealing the state's strategies? Yes, certainly. People have been charged for that in the past. As always, Whether a person will be charged with something has a lot to do with the political motivation of the state to charge them, which can be hard to predict. And of course, we can try to stay anonymous when we reveal state strategies to make repression less likely. A lot of these examples of physical surveillance come from Europe, uh, where you mentioned um, that you're from. I feel like this is the stuff that we saw in the USA 15 years ago, but it doesn't feel as common these days. I know that the EU has much stricter stricter privacy laws than the USA when it comes to what data tech companies can track. I wonder if this type of surve- physical surveillance is more common in the EU because EE European Union because it's more necessary. In the US cops can just go to Meta or AT&T or some other company without a warrant. Also, with the rise of Amazon Ring, law enforcement can access cam where people are putting cameras up for them in public in, you know, around their houses or in semi-public spaces. Could you talk about how the material circumstances of operating in the EU versus in Russia or the USA or the UK or whatever affects the approach that one might take towards countering surveillance? Before answering, I want to acknowledge that at the No Trace Project, our experience is mostly with Western Europe and North America. I'm from Western Europe, and some of our members are from North America. I want to learn more about other parts of the world, but I don't feel confident to speak about them. So I think that the reasoning you suggest about physical surveillance being less common in the U.S. is flawed. I'll try to explain why I think that. Just to be clear on the terms, what I mean by physical surveillance is the direct observation of a target. This means that a surveillance team is on the ground to watch or follow someone. For example, a suspect in a criminal case. A surveillance team is typically composed of at least five officers and several vehicles. For law enforcement and intelligence agencies, physical surveillance is a resource-intensive and personnel-intensive surveillance method. Because these agencies have limited resources and personnel, this means that physical surveillance isn't their preferred method. If they can obtain the results they want without using it, they won't use it. Physical surveillance is used when two factors combine. First, the crime being investigated is a sufficient threat to the state. For example, an arson. And second, the suspect being investigated needs to be monitored but cannot be monitored by more accessible surveillance methods, such as phone monitoring. In some cases, investigators try to monitor a suspect's phone or their social media and so on, 
and when this doesn't provide the results they want, they resort to physical surveillance. In other cases, investigators know from the start that they won't be able to monitor a suspect's phone or social media, for example because the suspect is an anarchist known to have good security, and from the start they resort to physical surveillance. And the thing is, all of this applies both to Europe and the U.S. So why does physical surveillance feel more common in Europe than in the U.S. in recent years? I believe it is simply because in recent years, anarchist attacks viewed by the state as more threatening, such as arson attacks, have been more common in Europe, which has led to a higher number of severe repressive operations, and severe repressive operations are more likely to feature physical surveillance. Roughly, I'd say there has been a drop in high-profile anarchist attacks in the U.S. between the end of the Green Scare in the 2000s and the 2020 uprising. This has led to fewer severe repressive operations and thus to fewer cases of physical surveillance. Interestingly, our threat library references two repressive operations from the U.S. that involved physical surveillance, one from 2000 and one from 2023. But of course, this could be a sampling bias. So in short, physical surveillance is probably used in the U.S. too, in particular in places where arson attacks have recently been claimed by anarchists. U.S. anarchists could anticipate the use of physical surveillance by developing an appropriate skill set. To help with that, we've recently translated to English a comprehensive German zine on the topic called Measures Against Surveillance, which can be found on our website. A second issue you mention is the impact of EU privacy laws on police investigations. I believe this impact is minimal. EU privacy laws mostly apply to private companies and not to law enforcement. Police in Europe can and do routinely request data from social medias, email providers, internet service providers, and so on. But then the question remains, what are the differences in state repressive techniques between countries and how can we take these differences into account? This is a good question and I don't have a comprehensive answer for it but I can try to discuss a few examples. As you said, doorbell cameras such as Amazon Ring are particularly widespread in the US, which increases the need to dress anonymously when tra traversing residential neighborhoods during an action. Compared to Western Europe, I think the US justice system more frequently offers immunity or reduced sentences in exchange for snitching, which should probably be taken into account, but how, I don't know. The practice of hiding microphones and cameras in apartments and GPS trackers on cars seems more widespread in Italy. The use of torture in police custody is more routine in Belarus and Russia. I suspect that the United Kingdom employs more long-term infiltrators than other European countries, but this is hard to quantify. Yeah, you make really good points. Considering the tools and technology widely available, the question of where do the devices displayed on NoTrace.how come from bubbles up in my mind. Have comrades been able to determine the sources of the surveillance tools used against them if they're coming from personal or social enemies, from bosses or mafias, political enemies like authoritarians or fascists, or just strictly from state actors? Ah, yes. You're talking about our Ears and Eyes project that lists cases of hidden surveillance devices such as microphones and cameras in apartments or GPS trackers on cars. We currently list more than 100 devices with vast disparities between countries. For example, we have 50 cases from Italy, but only five from the US. To answer your question, in most cases, no, comrades are not able to conclusively determine who installed a device. This is because most of the time, when a device is discovered, the spies don't try to retrieve it or even acknowledge it, and of course their name isn't written on it. This being said, I believe that the vast majority of the devices we list have been installed by state actors. To determine this, we can use two clues. The first clue is the context. If a device is found by people who are likely to be under investigation and don't have many personal or social enemies, the device was probably installed by law enforcement. The second clue is the device itself, its components and how it's assembled. Non-state actors tend to use store-bought devices. State actors tend to use either devices supplied by specialized companies that often only market them to law enforcement or devices that they manually assemble themselves. 
Similar to the question of the sources of technology, because the tools, tech, and knowledge is more ubiquitous, it would seem that NoTraces.how offers a lot of opportunities for counter-surveillance through reverse engineering those devices. Can you talk about this? Well, on our side, generally all we have access to is a brief description of a device components, and sometimes pictures, which is not enough for reverse engineering. This is because we only document what people publish online. But for the comrades who discover a surveillance device, I agree that there's a good opportunity for reverse engineering, and I would encourage comrades who find a device to try to disassemble it, understand it, and publish their findings online, if they can do so safely. For example, if a device has an SD card, Analyzing its contents, including by attempting to restore deleted files, could give clues to when the device was installed and how it operated. If a device has a SIM card, analyzing its contents with a SIM card reader could give clues to the identity of the spies. Recently, the SD card of a bug found in an anarchist library in France was analyzed, which revealed a few details about the device. Yeah, that example is really interesting. Listeners can find more on this by searching for Libertad Anarchist Library in Paris. I saw a post about it on anarchistnews.org some time ago that was pulled from eyes and ears, ears and eyes. It strikes me that people have to be paying a lot of attention to their surroundings when they'll notice that there's a small camera pointed at them from a skylight of a nearby building or the back window of a a van parked for too long on their street. This is nothing of finding a microphone installed installed inside of their photocopier machine, leaching tiny bits of electricity, as in the case of the Libertad Library in Paris. How do people find these, and what does it mean to have such an intimate knowledge of our surroundings uh, to be able to pick out what's out of place? Are there techniques or tools that are suggested for this sort of uh, exploration? About how people find these devices... Sometimes it's just by chance. For example, in the case of the Libertad Library in Paris, the comrades were simply dismantling the photocopy machine for repairs when they found the bug. And sometimes, people specifically search for surveillance devices and find some. In my opinion, if you suspect that a place or vehicle might be bugged and you want to search for surveillance devices, the first thing you should do is a manual visual search. For this, you need to know where devices are typically hidden, Our website can help with that. In the case of a building, devices are often hidden next to a power source, so they can be connected to it instead of needing a battery. You can take a screwdriver and other tools and dismantle power outlets, multi-socket adapters, ceiling lights, any electrical appliances, and look for anything that shouldn't be there. You can also look inside furniture, basically anywhere a device could fit. This is a long process. It can take several hours for a single room. In the case of a vehicle, devices are either hidden outside the vehicle, typically under it, or inside the vehicle. You can start by taking a look under the vehicle, inside wheels, on rear bumpers, behind ventilation grids, and looking for anything that shouldn't be there. Then, you can take appropriate tools and dismantle the interior, the ceiling, the dashboard, the seats, and so on. Devices can also be hidden in motorbikes or bicycles, for example, inside or under the seats. In the case of a camera installed at a window or nearby building, you might be able to detect it through binoculars, but of course it's a bit tricky. In the case of a camera installed in a surveillance vehicle in the street, this is where having an intimate knowledge of your surroundings, as you said, can be useful. I'll briefly explain a specific technique to detect surveillance vehicles with a camera pointed at your home. This technique only works if you live in a place where there aren't too many different vehicles that park, so it works in some residential areas in cities and in most rural areas. Basically, each time you exit or enter your home, you take note of all the vehicles parked in the street that have a line of sight to your home. You take note of their model, color, and license plate. You remember the information, or you write it down, as you prefer, but if possible, you try to do it without looking suspicious. After some time doing that, you will be familiar with the baseline of vehicles that park in your street, which will be the vehicles of people who live nearby or their guests. Once you're familiar with the baseline, 
you can spot vehicles that are not part of this baseline and scrutinize them carefully to check if they are surveillance vehicles. Specialized detection devices also exist, for example, radio frequency detectors to detect devices transmitting data on radio frequencies or camera lens detectors. I don't have experience with these detection devices, so I don't feel confident to talk about them, but I think they can be a valuable option that should be researched. Also, one thing that should be remembered is that when searching for bugs, you cannot rule out false negatives. If you don't find a bug, maybe there is one that you missed. And even if you do find a bug, maybe there are others that you missed. I think the point of searching for bugs should be to prevent the state from gathering information about us and not to consider a space to be free from surveillance devices. For example, I think that sensitive, incriminating conversations should not take place even in buildings that have been searched for bugs and should always take place outdoors and without electronic devices. One last thing I want to note is that another option to counter this threat is to try to prevent the installation of surveillance devices in the first place. To install a device in a building or vehicle, the state needs to access this building or vehicle. In the case of buildings, they typically make a covert entry when the occupants are not there, either by picking the lock or asking the building owner for the keys. This can be countered by making sure there's always someone in the building or by installing our own video surveillance system to monitor the building when we're not there. In the case of vehicles, they typically install devices on vehicles parked on public streets. This could be countered by never parking on public streets, but of course this isn't always possible. So in closing, I've seen activists over the years talking about engaging in conflict and the repercussions that they could experience from it in individual terms, mostly ignoring the social impact of state crackdowns and the network effect of counterinsurgency. Would you mind saying a bit about counter surveillance and security culture as community defense? For sure, repression can disrupt networks in both material dimensions, for example, by sending people to jail and psychological dimensions, for example, by spreading fear and distrust. We've already talked about the material dimensions in the rest of this discussion. I can talk about two things that I think we can do to address the psychological dimensions. The first thing is to find the right balance in how we mentally approach state repression. Specifically, I think we should avoid thinking both that we are powerless in the face of repression and thinking that repression will never strike. We are not powerless because we can organize. We can take measures against surveillance. We can avoid repression. We have agency. But it's equally wrong to think that the repression will never strike because we can't be sure of that. Even if we take a lot of precautions, there's always chance and things we can't predict. I think if we manage to find this balance, then if a comrade gets caught or if we get caught ourselves, we will know that we did our best to prevent that from happening but also we won't be taken by surprise. The second thing is that we can prepare for oppression. We can discuss with our friends about our fears of getting caught. We can make sure that the people who get arrested have lawyers. We can support our prisoners and make sure we include them in our struggles. If we pre prepare for repression, we'll be less taken by surprise if it strikes. Aster, thanks so much for taking the time that, um, to put together this conversation uh, and for the work that y'all are doing. Solidarity and appreciation to you. Thanks for the interview. It was a good opportunity for me to reflect on our work. It was really helpful. Just as a brief aside, if you plan to visit the site notrace.how, we suggest at least running a VPN, a virtual private network, just so you know, riseup.net has a free one that you can download for multiple devices. And we also suggest using an anonymized browser. One method might be also to download the Tor browser, which you can find for your operating system and device at ssd.eff.org. That's security self-defense on the Electronic Frontier Foundation website. They'll give you more tips there. And you can use that to visit No Trace Project via their tour address, which is listed in our show notes. This is the Final Straw Radio, and you just heard our recent chat with a member of the security information sharing site for anarchists that's found at notrace.how about countering state surveillance. <laughs> Ты 
зеркала Запутанные пути Мы отпечатки времени Потерянный, потерянный И небо, как всегда Дождем омоет дни И в темный скверах города Так холодно, так холодно Среди Несвязанных причин Не остается только Безумие, без толка Я готов остаться один я поиграю в Бога, о дивный новый мир. Стеклянные глаза, без виза вырежем, Пускаем по домам из мира в мир, из мира в мир. Отравлен океан, на небе правит дым, Среди несвязанных причин Не остается только Бесумие бестолка Я готов остаться один Внутри пустого гроба Я поиграю в Бога And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. Two quick reminders before this week's segment. First, Friday, March 15th, is International Day Against Police Brutality. And second, guns don't kill people, cops do. Save lives, kill cops. Thirty people in the U.S. were killed in mass shootings in the month of September 2023. That same month, 158 people were killed by cops according to an incomplete list compiled by the Washington Post. These are their names. Jalen Latrell Rout, Edward Ben Garcia, Jeremy Finch, Stefan Ford, Lewis Earl Johnson Jr., Bradley Hatcher, George Joe Appleby, David Adrian Mendez Lopez, Michael Wayne Owen Sr., Sherman Crutcher, 
Joshua Lee Walker, Robert Boozer, Leon Minifield, Michael Wilson, Jacob Matthew String, Dante D. Warner, Antonio Lacunas Escobar, Johnny J. Angel, Maureen Betty Wyatt Miller, Dal Pathwi Apet, Jamal Walker, Louis Mo, Alexis White, Xiong Zhang Dun. Name withheld, September 7th, Fort Hall, Idaho. Christopher Huffman, Richard Sonier Jr. Name withheld, September 7th, Mendenhall, Mississippi. Ryan Richard Henricks, Tyron Ty Miro, Quentin Hill, Michael Lale, Cynthia Nicole Lale Fox, Brent D. Conrad, name withheld, September 8th, Beckley, West Virginia, Robert Crockett, Robert Logan, Philip Hanolt, Mamedi Sisse, Anthony Stinson, David Maynard, name withheld, September 10th, Prescott, Arizona, Lamoris Dewan Spike, Jr., Matthew Xavier Johnson, Jory Jamar Lester, Nathan Liverpool, name withheld, September 11th, El Paso, Texas, Sidney Dobson, Raheem Freeman, Angelo Curcioni, Clavon Donnell Miles, Carlos Dionda, Shea Lawrence McKenna, Anthony Chavez, Sterling Keon Arnold, Robert Kyle Sider, Lucas Jansma, Michael Pinto, Matthew Edward Healy, Jesus Fernando Hernandez, William Willie Burrell Nelson, Nathan K. Wood, Reginald Reggie Owens, Cesar Armando Aguirre, Eric LeVon Taylor, Brian Dustin Shunway, Abel Valencia, Carl Shuhe, Alejandro Fadoa, Seyede Mandane Moenini, Dimitri Humphrey, name withheld, September 20th, San Mateo, California, Lamar Walker, Ivan Solis Mora, Catherine Michelle Cologne, Cody Armstrong, name withheld, September 21st, Markham, Illinois, name withheld, September 22nd, Banning, California. Oscar Alfonso Maxwell III, Larry Wayne Harvey III, Rick Tez Williams, Kaina Kaohu, Brian Edward Spencer, Byron Brown, Joel Castaneda, Tiffany Louise McCoy, Jorge Ramirez Rivera, Michael Raymond Shirley, Nicholas Chile Avila, Layla A. Williams, Darman Graves Jr., Homero Gordo Carrillo, Tammy Michelle Naylor, Damon A. Hubbard, Jesse Frank Harris, David Rodriguez Lopez, Justin Gonzalez, Ernest Robert Burbage III, Stephen Clay Perkins, Thomas McGinty, Olivia A. Schwab, James Milton Brown, William A. Hicks, Jr., Floyd Young, Samantha M. Belk, Cameron Darden, John Taylor, Kiana Brown, Isaac Ivan Asagueva, 
This is anarchist prisoner Sean Swain from the Super Duper Uber Mega Ultra Hyper Turbo Multi Maxi Max in Youngstown, Ohio. If you're listening, you are the resistance. You can still write Sean at his new old new again address at Sean Swain number A two four three two zero five OSP Youngstown eight seven eight Coitsville Hubbard Road Youngstown Ohio four four five zero five. You can find his past writings, updates on his case, hear his past audio, find out how to get his books, plus ways to contribute to his legal defense fund at seanswain.org. This is The Final Straw Radio. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at TFSR, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. Programming support is brought to you by Firestorm Books. Located at 1022 Haywood Road in West Asheville, Firestorm is a bookstore and social movement space owned by its workers in operation since 2008. Their event calendar and complete catalog of books can be found online at firestorm.coop.